There's always been a Hollywood and politicos combination, but are they strange bedfellows or perfectly suited for each other? The Khashoggi murder. How really did he die? Or did you see that body double from Saudi Arabia? Hmm. We'll talk about that on the program as well. And how dare millennials rebel against their boomer parents by not getting divorced? How traditional. Hello there, Terry here on Think America, where we reason first and then converse. I'm Terry Gilbert. This is America's Radio Town Hall. I invite real Americans to the program every week to chew on thought-provoking conversation starters, and this week is no different. I want to welcome to the show Shane. Shane formerly worked on political campaigns and currently works as an organic gardener. Nice to have you, Shane. Welcome aboard. So good to be with you, Terry. All right. So let's get right to it. On October 2nd, the Saudi national and U.S. green card holder, Jamal Khashoggi, and most Americans at this point know this name. He went into the Saudi embassy in Istanbul to get a copy of his divorce papers so that he could remarry. And this we know from international reports. Anonymous Turkish sources claim that he was tortured, cut into pieces, and his body parts were buried inside a forest outside of Istanbul. But the Saudi story is that he was involved in a fistfight brawl, which he instigated, leading to his inevitable strangulation. In other words, their point of view is that he instigated this, so therefore he was finally strangled. Um, and had he not instigated it, he wouldn't have been killed. His body was then rolled into a rug by a cooperative. It was not caught up, according to the Saudi story. And the crown prince and the king were not involved. They knew nothing. But in turn, they have arrested 18 men. One of the men is a general. So that's kind of like the fall guy. And then there was another high ranking official as well, and maybe a third. Anyway, the count that I got was 18 men. Now, we know that Jamal worked as a journalist. And what we get on this end is that he was an American journalist. But the reality is he went into self-exile out of Saudi Arabia last year in 2017. And the Washington Post hired him for a column. So he wasn't your typical beat reporter, American citizen. He had a green card to work here. So, Shane, let me start with you. What what do you think about this story in general? The Turkish report, which has been kind of mixed and very, very bloody versus the Saudi report. Let's let's start there. So this is probably the most bizarre story, and it almost seems as if it came off of a, a movie screen or a script. And we still don't know who's telling the truth on this. The Saudis say one thing that appears to be more mild the Turks say, no, this was uh, a, a brutal, uh, horrifying, bloodthirsty type of murder that took place. And somewhere in the middle there, the investigators will probably emerge to talk about this. So what makes it even more interesting is that uh, this this uh, journalist, actually he's more of a columnist for the Washington Post, that's what he was hired for, came from um, somewhat of the propaganda arm of the Saudis before he defected and then moved into uh, pushing back and being coming critical of the kingdom. And he uh, seems, from what all I've seen him uh, reports about him, he seems to be somewhat more of a hardliner religious uh, uh, person than more of one for reform. And that's why he was critical of the Saudis. And that makes him in more in alignment with. The, I have the, read just the opposite, but I can see that it's a very bizarre story. And it and it's one that puts puts the United States and this administration in a bit of a pickle. Over 600,000 jobs, U.S. jobs are scattered around Saudi Arabia and various different capacities, mostly the oil industry. Now, he, from what I have read, and I've pretty gone pretty deep and broad on this, Shane, he was a progressive. Now, people, a Saudi national, to be sure, and during the days of the pre-9-11 Osama bin Laden buildup, when he started Osama bin, Laden's, uh, bin Laden 
started um, setting up terrorist camps. This goes way back to the Clinton administration, terrorist camps in Afghanistan. He wasn't as outspoken against Osama bin Laden at that time. But Mm -hmm. then when it became clear that Osama bin Laden was the black sheep of that family, uh, he started to speak up against Osama bin Laden and certainly after 9-11 cut ties with Osama bin Laden. Uh, but you are absolutely right. He has written for the Saudi press. He was editor of various different uh, organiza- press organizations in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh. And you do not speak ill of the government. I mean, you can take some pokes and some jabs from time to time, but you don't you don't have freedom of speech to speak ill in the way that we do here. And so when he finally sort of had it, with the crown prince and defected, well, exiled himself, voluntarily exiled, then he started to speak up more against the crown. So that's what I'm getting. And so it's no wonder that if they're out to get him, they're going to lure him into their embassy in Istanbul and do the dirty deed. So what you're saying then is this was more of a, a an act of shutting down the criticism of Khashoggi than anything else. Uh, but what I'm understanding also is that he was somewhat aligned with the the dictator, ruler, president of Turkey. Uh, and that has provoked Turkey's interest in this and trying to get to the truth. Never mind the fact that they've got like 300 journalists sitting in prison after the 2016 uprising that they had. And, and so there's some reconciliation issues going on. Are you referring to the Turkish coup? Yes, yes. And yes, so- of course. There was a coup against the Erdogan government. Wait, it, Turkey is still secular. The conversation is that it is leaning more toward uh, the Erdogan hard Islamic points of view. Now, Istanbul is how many millions of people are in Istanbul? Millions and millions and millions of people are in, are in 15, 20 million people are mm-hmm. in Istanbul. And it's a secular uh, city. Uh, so why he chose to, as some people say, take the bait and walk into that embassy, I don't know. Maybe he thought he would be safe. Maybe he thought I, it's hard to know that. So you raise a really good point about his particular religious leanings. Maybe he was a little more hardline. But then on the other hand, he exiles himself voluntarily and is a now by extension, uh, finds himself employed with the Washington Post to write about the Middle East. Um, And he wants to be remarried. So he sounds very progressive. He talked about things, for example, women driving that he praised the crown prince about that. But then on the other hand, says that the crown prince, the prince is backward. You know, the crown prince has, from what I've read, caused the deaths of other high ranking officials if they are not in lockstep with the crown prince. And as far as the United States is concerned, I don't think we're any big friend of the crown prince, but we have to tread lightly on this. And two things come to mind. One, that President Trump is giving the Saudis a lot of room to make up their mind about their story. And I think that is great for President Trump. You know, hold him back from the tweets and so forth and give the Saudis room to take responsibility and get their story straight before we respond. That is very sharp, very, very insightful and very good. The other thing is that by saying that Secretary of of our Treasury Sam, uh, Secretary Munchen, um, will not be at uh, Davos in the desert. That is a very good move as well. Although I did hear this past week, Shane, that uh, Secretary Munchen is meeting with the crown prince. All of that's good. Pompeo's in it and all that. We need to find out what our response is. Uh, so it's very intriguing. My take is that the Turkish report is accurate. Saudis are finding their footing in this. We have to be careful because this is Saudi Arabia we're talking about and and we need them as well as Jordan and other areas of the Middle East to help in our fights. 
our, our fights against Iran and even Russia and our situation in Afghanistan still, where we have 15,000 troops. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that our American media has been obsessed with this. And I think in some ways they're very close to trying to provoke Trump to say the wrong thing about journalists because much of his conversations when he's at the campaign rallies is to point out fake news and uh, the press is enemy of the people. And so I think there's a component there with our American press trying to see if they can push him into a corner so that they make uh, him look like a bad guy going out against journalists, much like um, what the Saudis are they're the box that they find themselves into as well. There's also this element, and I, I it, it's very hard to get reports on this with his connection to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, it, it, to me, it sounds to me, Shane, that the bottom line at the top of the page is when somebody goes into voluntary exile to leave the country, he's fed up with his homeland. So that goes for so many and that, that goes to answers to so many of these questions. How deep was he in his faith? Is he a, a, an Islamicist? Is he Sunni? Is he, what is he? You know, we're trying to figure out who this man is. To me, when you say sayonara, there, there was something about all of that that says, I'm fed up. I want to be free. I want to be more westernized. I want to remarry. I want to start my life anew. And I'm going to get a green card, which he did, and work for the Washington Post. And I think maybe the Saudis viewed him as a, a chameleon and somebody that was just unpredictable, especially um, in his criticism for them, although he had worked as part of their propaganda arm for years and aligned himself with some of the hardliners. Now, you know, they figure, well, this is one way to do it. And the, as a result, it comes off as a very bizarre, you know, with the body double and the the, the recording that was it on an Apple watch. There's so many just very bizarre components to this story. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. So we're down to about, uh, I would say about a minute. Um, do you think the Saudis so far, Shane, have botched the operation in terms of the PR and the press to it? We really don't know what happened. I'm of the Turkish I, I'm in the Turkish camp with their description and my goodness, cleaning up the blood and all that and sending 15 hitmen in. And one was a doctor to make sure that he was dead and somebody had a chainsaw to cut his body to ribbons. My goodness. But what do you think of the Saudi regime themselves in terms of the PR move? I think the Saudis have botched the PR on this. I think they're put themselves into a box where they're slowly backing out and revising the story as they go along and it doesn't look good for them all right you're listening to think america with terry gilbert nice to have you america on board be right back We're back on Think America. You can find me on Facebook, Terry Talk Radio. Subscribe to our podcast at thinkamericaradio.com. You can get all the shows. All right, Shane, let me switch directions and ask you about this one. The Hollywood and Politico's combination, I've always thought, is a very interesting one. Some people say, oh, it's strange bedfellows. What is Jack Kennedy doing with Marilyn Monroe, for example? Uh, how dare he? But, you know, uh, Elvis has been in the White House. We've had all kinds of connections between presidents and the Hollywood types. There are benefits and there are disadvantages, I would say, with combining Hollywood celebrities with newsmaker politicians. Sometimes the combo can be quite costly, but sometimes it can be very advantageous. So uh, let's just review a little bit. Nixon had Elvis to the White House. Bill Clinton played the sax on Arsenio Hall. Remember that? Uh, Ellen and Stevie Wonder partied with Obama, and those are just a few names. Uh, now Trump has Kanye and Kim Kardashian in the Oval. So let, let, let me put it this way. Does chumming up to Hollywood celebs these days help or hurt a politician, particularly a politician who's the president? It, that's a hard call because it depends on how popular the celebrity is. For example, um, somebody like Roseanne Barr, 
is very uh, popular among a very narrow group of Americans. But somebody like a Kanye uh, who has a wide reach um, can certainly help somebody. What's what's interesting about this is this is a, a coming together of, of power and fame and it's mutually beneficial for both parties in doing something like this. And I think that's why presidents over the decades have brought celebrities into the White House. It gives them a photo opportunity. It gives the the person, the celebrity, uh, a little bit more gravitas when it, they go out into the culture and say they they danced with President Clinton or played sack, you know, that type of thing. So. Um, I think it's a mutual benef- mutually beneficial move on both parts, and I you don't be surprised to see this continue to happen. Well, I, I, here's my take on it. Uh, yes, it's mutually beneficial uh, to both parts, or they wouldn't because they piggyback off each other's celebrity. But here's what I have noticed over the years: we were in the past not as political as a nation. There was Washington. They did their thing over there and we went about our business. And if Elvis Presley was Democrat or Republican, I wouldn't have known it. Right. Is Arsenio Hall Democrat or Republican? But then there's this shift. And now we see, oh, celebrities are taking sides. Most are on the left, as we know. But there are people you mentioned Roseanne Barr. You mentioned I mentioned Kanye. And there's others. Taylor Swift wouldn't be caught dead these days with Trump in the White House. So in terms of it being advantageous, the backstory to that is which side are you on for Trump to invite Taylor Swift or even certain NBA players or soccer players from Europe or something to the White House? They would, shall I say, take a knee, maybe, you know, they would put their fist up in the air against it. Um, it's not like the White House of the olden days where it's a privilege and an honor to be invited by a president. Today, we have a Republican president, God forbid, versus a Democrat president. And I saw this happening a little bit with the Bushes, certainly with Obama. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, as we become more polarized in our political opinions people are are starting to identify celebrities and sports athletes um as to whose side of the aisle are they on are they a republican or are they a democrat and therefore i don't like that team or i'll never watch that guy's movie and so the the polarization that's happening in our culture is starting to to bleed over into our celebrities and that's why taylor swift got so much of a bad rap over the last uh, couple of weeks because of her comments and weighing in in the election. And it goes back to, you know, what, what somebody said was just shut up and sing, just shut up and perform and keep your politics or your sports uh, out, out of the, the two. And don't. Let- that was a book written for the audience. That was a book written by Laura Ingram, shut up and sing. Um, I understand, but you mentioned Taylor Swift to her fans. They're on her side. I wouldn't be caught dead in the White House, et cetera, et cetera. So we do have this polarization. Quick, we're down to about a minute and a half, but I want to get to this in particular, Shane. So is it important to be in the oval? You know, you can chum up at a a wine and cheese maybe or at a big gala, but in the oval, does that help the office itself to have a celebrity in the Oval Office. To me, it doesn't look good. It just doesn't. I I don't mind if you take a meeting outside, but the Oval is so revered in my mind. It's jarring for me to see that, no matter who they are. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure. I think it can hurt, but it can also help depending on how highly respected a celebrity is. Uh, in the case to which side, though, yeah, and it depends on who they like Charlton Heston when he was a guest of, of George W. Bush. Um, you know, it, that totally brought in the Second Amendment crowd because Charlton. I Heston say a, stay out of the oval. You want to go meet outside at some uh, function. That's different. But the oval is everybody's official office. And I think we're too polarized. Thank you, Shane, very much. We'll be back with my interview with a justice regarding the independent judiciary and this Red for Ed campaign 
uh, with regard to judges around the nation. I'm Terry Gilbert. You're listening to Think America. And we're back on Think America. I'm Terry Gilbert. This is America's Radio Town Hall. Reason first and then converse. You can find me at Terry Talk Radio on Facebook. Subscribe to our podcast at thinkamericaradio.com. Delighted to have a justice on the Supreme Court from the state of Arizona. He is the first and only independent jurist appointed ever to the Arizona Supreme Court. And I've invited him on the program to talk about this Red for Ed national campaign and how it impacts judges around the nation. Red for Ed is connected with education and education funding, money for education. And in Arizona this past year, there has been quite an upheaval over the Red for Ed. Due to pressure from the Red for Ed campaign, this justice and another judge, another justice, I should say, are now in this election season being attacked by this campaign. A little of the backstory is last month, the majority of the court invalidated the Invest in Ed initiative, which would substantially raise income taxes to increase education funding beyond, above and beyond now, the 19% teacher salary increase approved last year. And the full court has not, to my knowledge yet, made a decision, a full decision on it. But in the meantime, two justices are being targeted. So welcome to the program, Justice Clint Bollock. Hello, sir. Great to be with you, Terry. Okay. Now, it's my understanding when it came to the invest in ad, not read for ad, but then invest in ad monies, um, that particular initiative got the uh, got the gavel down or the no by some justices on the Supreme Court because it said we're going to raise the income taxes of just the wealthy and in fact it doesn't raise the income taxes of just the wealthy it raises the income taxes of everyone in your state of Arizona correct that's right uh, a majority of the court in a very brief order disqualified the measure from the ballot any time you circulate a petition here and in most states you have to provide a short description to the people who are uh, who you're being who are being asked to sign the petition and uh, you're absolutely right the uh, the description said this raises taxes on people with incomes above 250 thousand dollars and a majority of the court concluded that in fact it would raise taxes on most taxpayers and uh, because that uh, was at at best confusing and and uh, at worst completely omitted a, a very important part of the initiative that uh, that we couldn't be confident that uh, the voters uh, were informed about what they were signing. All right. Now, has there been, well, before I move on to that, how many of the justices said thumbs down on that before it went to the full court? So that is not yet uh, official. And until we we publish a a full opinion, um, justices are are free to change their minds. So uh, That won't be official until the decision comes out. But we did say that it was a majority of the court, which implies that uh, that there was not complete unanimity. I see. Uh, When do you expect a full court decision? Before the election. Before the election. So the election is about two weeks away. Yes. (laughs) So uh, I can say that the court is working very, very diligently. And of course, any time you have disagreement among the justices, uh, it means a a spirited debate and uh, lots of drafts going back and forth. Well, it sounds like you want to make the deadline. Is that advantageous to make the deadline or uh, or not advantageous? You know, I guess it, it depends. 
depends on one's perspective, but but we feel that we have a, a moral obligation to inform the public. First of all, you know, it's it's no small thing to remove an initiative from the ballot. As a lawyer, I had two removed from the ballot, and uh, I have to tell you, it hurts. Uh, but my reaction when uh, the Arizona Supreme Court knocked one of my ballot measures off when I was a, a lawyer, um, I dusted myself off. Uh, we got it back on the ballot two years later, and I'm proud to say that it's now part of the Arizona Constitution. We certainly didn't try to uh, try to remove the justices who who disappointed us. Um, so, but nonetheless, all of us feel very strongly that uh, that the citizens of Arizona should know uh, exactly the reasoning for our decision before election day. Correct. All right. Now, but in the meantime, the red for ed or they would this invest in ed initiative part of the red for ed campaign the activists for this are going after two justices you being one of them on the supreme court and another justice just in the meantime to to do what what is their aim try to get you unseated try to just create some discord uh, what what do you think is their aim so those uh, members of the Red for Ed movement who are trying to uh, unseat Justice Palander and me, uh, we are, uh, as all judges are in Arizona, we're up for retention periodically. And the two of us happen to be on the ballot this year. And uh, the uh, some of the folks in, in Red for Ed who are unhappy with the decision uh, have uh, adopted the rallying cry of remember in November and uh, they want to uh, they want to punish us uh, for uh, and, and the court indirectly for rendering a decision that removes this from the ballot. But they haven't, it's my understanding, they haven't cited you or another justice particularly. It's just that you and this other justice have only been in the seats now for two years. So you're up for, uh, in other words, you're kind of, for lack of a better description, your two-year probationary period could be officially over if they have their way because attack two justices who are on the ballot for retention for the next go around. Because the next go around puts you on the on the seat for six years. Isn't that correct? That's right. We happen to be the two justices who are up for retention this year. Uh, this is the year that people are upset. And as a result, uh, uh, for for many in, in the in the movement, uh, we are the targets. All right. So how are you and the other justice combating this? I know there's things you can't say. You kind of have to just take it. Um, and the voter doesn't know a lot of this, and yet they vote for or against justices. What is your counter to this? Because you just declared that the full court hasn't made a rendering. And, and so it appears to me, and I'm sure to the naked eye, that they're out to get the two justices for retention just in case. Well, I, I think that's right. And certainly, uh, the everyone will know before the election which justices voted which way. Um, but, you know, I decided not to put together a formal campaign. And the reason for that is that I don't want people um, who may have business before the court contributing to to my campaign. I think that that would create a, a conflict. So uh, basically, the main thing that I have been doing, I put together a website with every single one of my opinions on it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I believe in, in full transparency. Um, we have a judicial review commission, which asks everyone who has appeared before justices who are on the ballot, they rank them, they rate them in terms of integrity, judicial ability, and so forth. Um, and I'm happy to report that I got near perfect or near perfect scores, even from people um, presumably, who lost their cases before us, and those, you know, those are those are not uh, sexy campaign ads. <laughs> they're not attack ads or anything like that. Uh, but they're they're the best we can do to defend ourselves um, and maintain the integrity of the court. To and make one sure other that thing I would say, we're down to thirty seconds, so I'll I'll wrap now. But one other thing is that you are the first and only independent. 
uh, jurist appointed to the AZ Supreme Court. So with that good score and being independent, I think you'll survive pretty well. Justice Clint Bollock, we need to leave it there. I appreciate you coming on the program and talking about the Invest in Ed initiative. Good luck in the next couple of weeks. Thanks so much, Terry. All right. We'll be talking to you later. Thank you very much. You're listening to Think America with Terry Gilberg, or Reason First and Then Converse. ThinkAmericaRadio.com is where you can find our podcast. We're back on Think America. Want to bring this topic to the air. This is a fun one, everybody. How dare millennials rebel against their boomer parents by not getting divorced? The nerve, the nerve of them. Because most boomers don't say very many complimentary things about millennials. They remind us that they live in uh, homes in the basement and they sport many a tattoo and they get around on a skateboard, some of them. And if they work, they work from a laptop with earbuds inserted. They tend to be self-serving. They're always late. Um, What else do boomers say about millennials? They spend retirement funds on eating out uh, at Chinese food or takeout at Chinese food or pizzas and so forth, uh, or slurping lattes or going to extravagant spas. Plus, they're not traditional. I think that kind of says it all. So how dare they stay in a marriage? I mean, that's just really rebellious against a boomer parent, isn't it? (laughs) Shane, staying married isn't trendy. So why are millennials staying married? I think that they take their relationships very, very serious. Um, They tend to be a little bit more sensitive than than other folks. Uh, I'm, I fall into the category of a boomer and I also have a child who is a a millennial and uh, I actually have several, but I think that it comes down to, they take their relationships very serious. They tend to get married at an older age. And from what I've seen, it's kind of a status symbol to have a marriage uh, and and to kind of put that on, on a, uh, you know, kind of the trophy you know, this is this is my marriage and I take it very serious as well as they take their tattoos seriously and their piercings <laughs> seriously and their children out of wedlock seriously and <laughs> on and on and on. Um, staying married, of course, isn't trendy. And you make a good point if they are serious about who they are and what they represent and how they work and the lattes that they slurp back, you know, three or four or five a day, whatever. Um, then that's a very interesting analysis that they take it seriously. However they do it, you know, believe them. This is who they are. Uh, America's divorce rate, just FYI has dropped 18% from 2008 to 2018. This is according to, an analysis I found at the University of Maryland, a sociology professor named Philip Cohen, who studies this, uh, has given out this statistic, dropped 18% from 2008. I always refer to 2008 in my mind with the beginning of the Obama rise for those 18, uh, for those eight years. And now we've got two more years. So we've got now 10 years, 18%. Of that 18%, 8 percent is attributed to young couples who approach relationships very differently from their parents. How could millennials possibly get marriage right? Well, to your point, they're serious. Okay, I accept that. And I tend to think that they're more sensitive about it as well. They make those decisions and they want to make sure that they get it right. And maybe it's because they look back at their parents and say, you know, my parents kind of screwed up a little bit. Maybe I don't want to go down that road. Do you think that there might be this element? Because I read a study about this and said, ponder how their parents' generation, with so many other things that kind of came at them, overthought a lot of things. And in overthinking the marriage and perhaps now they got two kids and then, you know, maybe they got wealthy or maybe they got poor or whatever. And then finally said, okay, I'm out of it. 
and sort of impulsively got out of it. Whereas millennials might not be overthinking it. They fall in love with that guy they met at a Starbucks drinking a Slurpee um, or that gal they met on the beach and they're not overthinking it and they're just happier as a result, just staying in the marriage. Do you think there's an element to that? Oh, uh, there's a certain part of it. I think some of it is emotionally driven, but I also tend to think that millennials um, don't want to make mistakes because they've been kind of put in this this platform of you can do no wrong and therefore you have to live up to it. And so there's a, a high sensitivity to it. They tend to be in these relationships a lot longer before they actually tie the knot. They tend to be more educated. They want to make sure that they're making the right decision and that they're not going to disappoint. Do you think they are more educated? This, from what surveys and studies I've seen, I think they are. I think that the folks that are tend to mm. not be as educated tend to have more breakups uh, for, from the data that mm. I've seen. Uh, maybe in general. I'm not sure the millennials are really educated. They might have more degrees. But I'm not sure they are that much more educated. I mean, that's a, that's an out there statement. I don't know. I might get some mail on that. Um, but I'm not sure that they truly know as much as their degree would necessarily represent. <laughs> okay, good discussion with you. Thank you very much. Let's switch and hear what our millennial does have to say when Megan comes on the air. I'm Terry Gilberg. Stick around. Welcome back to Think America with Terry Gilbert, where we reason first and then converse. This is America's Radio Town Hall. Again, subscribe to our podcast. Go to thinkamericaradio.com. Click on the podcast. You can get all of our past shows. We love having you on board. You can also reach us at that website. You can find me at Facebook, Terry Talk Radio, and reach out to me individually as well. Megan Porth is on the air as she does. She always contributes in this last segment. Hi, Megan. Hey, Terry. How dare millennials, and you are one, rebel against their boomer parents by not getting divorced. I was just talking to our talker earlier. Uh, they have a lot of nerve in doing this. Millennials don't have a good reputation with boomers. They're very, very different than boomers. And yet here they are very traditional with regard to marriage. How is that? Well, I think that I, I think this is really funny that there's this, you know, little unsaid, not unsaid, but this war between boomers and millennials, especially since millennials have raised boomers. Um, uh, so what I hear a lot is that millennials are terrible, they're entitled. Um, and then and then it's like, well, when are you going to come and visit me right from your mother? <laughs> so she says, you guys don't ever do any of these things. You don't ever move out. And then it's like, well, don't leave. But I think that the reason that we are seeing less divorce is simply because we're waiting longer to get married. Um, you know, many of us, many millennials grew up with uh, our parents being married and divorced sometimes multiple times. And I think we were, we were watching Terry. I think we were looking, we were saying, okay, well, what, what, how could I do this potentially differently? And a lot of times when we talk to our parents, many of the questions that we asked when we said, well, what about your first marriage? Oh, well, I got married too young. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't, uh, I, I went from my parents' house directly into my husband's house or into my wife, it moved in with my wife. And I think that for millennials, what they're doing now is they're very focused on their careers. They're really focused on getting their finances in order and understanding um, a little bit more about life before they actually settle down and get married. And they're also living together because we don't have that social stigma surrounding uh, premarital living. So I think a lot of people are getting to know each other. And so that, well, that gives them... That sounds a little bit like... Uh, what we were talking about with the talkers uh, earlier, uh, the, the consensus was millennials are just more serious. Uh, that may be true. You kind of narrowed it into, it sounds like you say marriage is very serious, but narrowed it into, 
waiting longer so it's not more of a marry the first boy you kiss or the first girl you kiss. Right. That's exactly what it is. It's this idea that you don't have to get married immediately um, and that that's very formulaic. Some of my friends aren't even contemplating marriage. That's one of the things that this kind of non-traditional paradigm shift that millennials are bringing, which I think is very interesting. It's that, okay, well, there isn't, you don't have to have the white picket fence and the 2.5 children. You can actually uh, carve out your own destiny and your own future. The other reason why I think potentially, Terry, and this I, I'm not a psychologist, but why I think maybe the uh, divorce uh, rates are declining is also people are more comfortable with mental health awareness. And the truth is, is that married couples need help. We need to get into see marriage counselors before we hate each other's guts and want to divorce. So I think that that has also contributed to the fact that divorce uh, marriages are lasting longer. But why would you need to get into a marriage counselor if you waited longer, which kind of says to me, you played the field, you found Mr. Right or Miss Right, and you would, you know each other, you're two peas in a pod, he's your best friend, she's your best friend. Why then the marriage counseling? Oh, and that's exactly the idea that's been perpetuated throughout society is that once you get married, you find your prince charming, everything that falls into line afterward is perfect, but that's the opposite. The real work starts after you get married. Everybody needs help. All right. Good segment, Megan. Uh, It's sponsored by yourcontractshop.com, Megan Porth for Change Your Life Technology. What you got? Well, we're talking about telemedicine today, which is really fascinating to me because I'm kind of practicing telelaw. And basically what this is, is it's opening up the playing field for individuals who normally can't access all of these specialist type of medicine, uh, medical providers um, in some of these populations that are underserved. So what it does is it allows patients to access doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, counselors, all kinds of medical providers from their phone or from their computer. Um, We're seeing this, this is a huge game changer, especially in opioid addiction, because what we're seeing is that this is prevalent in some of these underserved communities. So now they can utilize telemedicine to access all of the services that they need without having to leave their home. Megan Porth, sponsored by yourcontractshop.com. She is a contributor on the show. She's a millennial, she's a mom, and she's a lawyer. Good job. That's it for this edition of Think America. I want to thank Shane. I want to thank Megan, our millennial for being on the program. Of course, you for Reason First and Then Converse. You can find us at thinkamericaradio.com. I'm Terry Gilbert. Till next time, Think America, Reason First, Then Converse. The Titanic is sailing again. Yes, it's round two for the famous ship. But is it jinxed already? We'll talk about it on the program. Speaking of jinxes and hexes, witches are political these days. We'll talk about what they have to do with this election. And cashing in on lonely people. Are we doing that in today's robotic world? Hello there, Terry here on Think America, where we reason first and then converse. I'm Terry Gilbert. Welcome to the show. This is Americana Radio Town Hall. I ask a thought-provoking conversation questions uh, to those who come on the program, real Americans, and they let their hair down and we have robust conversation. I want to welcome Shane to the program. Shane, nice to have you on the program, being a talker, one of Terry's talkers across this great land that we have. Nice to have you. Uh, My card says you are an organic farmer. What do you produce? Oh, all everything that you could possibly sell uh, and eat and stay healthy. Wow. So fruits and vegetables mostly. Yes. Lots of greens, I would imagine. So welcome to the program. Nice to have you. Thank you for having me. Find us at thinkamericaradio.com. By the way, subscribe to our podcast there. Let's get right to it. Let's talk about this witches uh, story. I came, well, it's not just a story. There's multiple stories out there. A group of self-described witches gathered together this past uh, week in Brooklyn, uh, they said they wanted to perform a ritual to hex Justice Brett Kavanaugh and to hex President Trump. 
And it's not just like any old hex that you used to do if you played around as a kid with an Ouija board or you put uh, pins in a voodoo doll when you were a kid and you uh, played around trying to become, um, uh, I don't know, talk to the dead and you were playing with the occult. Uh, a, a hex to cause suffering is what they're after on Kavanaugh and the president. They said they intend to make Kavanaugh suffer. Uh, there is one witch called Dakota. Dakota spearheaded the event held in an occult bookstore in Brooklyn. Uh, Dakota is a woman. She claimed that Kavanaugh's confirmation was proof that survivors of sexual assault often do not get justice by going through the courts. Huh, okay. And that witchcraft can come to the rescue. Do you believe that, Shane? Witchcraft coming to the rescue for this because the courts can't do it. We, we're in 2018, I think. This sounds something out of the 16th or 17th century. And I thought, <laughs> I thought that our justice courts work pretty well for people who are pursuing uh, crimes in terms of sexual assault and harassment and that type of thing. So I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to figure out why this is a, a thing. And I can only come up with, you know, a couple of ideas. So I don't, I, I I'm, and what are those, what are well, these ideas? One thing, the first thing I think of is this is nothing more than a publicity stunt. This, this um, Dakota, and I don't know how you say his or her last name, but it, it seems like you know, go to a bookstore in downtown Brooklyn to draw attention to yourself. But I think uh, he's been on several media interviews to talk about. All right. Just just for the record, it's Dakota Braziale. It's uh, the he is not a he. It's a woman. Dakota is a woman and did a whole interview in Newsweek. Our audience can check that out. B-R-A-C-C-I-A-L-E, Braziale. Uh, go ahead. But but it seems like maybe there's some uh, financial component to this and obviously to get some publicity. The second thing is, um, I think that there's a struggle among this very niched group of people to say, hey, we don't have any power anymore. The The conservatives, they have the Congress, they have the presidency, and now they have the court. And the only thing that we can do right now is try to summon some kind of spirit to create some kind of harm and distress on, on this to exercise some power for us. And then third, uh, I, I think it's uh, a matter of searching for some religious um, meaning in life. And, and these folks who you would think would be so focused on science and the modern day technology and doing things through process and all of that, have turned not to God or to some benevolence, but to turn to some kind of evil portion of this to make things happen in their behalf. And so it, it just doesn't seem like a very uh, common thing or people would really tended other than just, hey, let's get some publicity out of this. It's interesting how they've used sexual assault and no justice on sexual assault in such a sanctimonious way, such a highfalutin moral way, because witchcraft is associated with evil. The occult is associated with evil for those who are religious, particularly Christians. So I found that kind of interesting. And so there's a, a, that kind of irony there, a little bit of the spin there. Do you believe in occult powers, Shane? Well, I am a person of faith. And so I do believe that there is an evil. And I also believe there is a good. And I tend to believe in a Judeo-Christian belief. So I believe that there is a devil and the devil will do evil things to people. And so I don't shake this off lightly and, and come from the mindset of a secular humanist perspective. Although you would think that the folks that are most opposed to Kavanaugh come mainly from that contingent in society. So, so if you are of the Judeo-Christian tradition, you believe in, when you say, I believe in a devil, you mean an evil spirit that you call the devil, correct? Yes. And All right. I, and, and so uh, con contrast to that with uh, the flip of that would be you believe in a holy spirit. 
correct? Yes. So with that, would you say a Holy Spirit or Holy Spirits, plural, can combat witchcraft or the occult? Would you believe that? Do you believe that? Yes, and even protect those who are um, relying on the Holy Spirit. So if this is going on in Brooklyn, how do you, as a Christian believer that believes in Holy Spirits, how do you conjure up the Holy Spirit to counter the evil that's being done in Brooklyn? Do you light candles? Do you pray more? Do you have rosary beads? Do you have um, a worry bead? What do you use? Do you have incense? Are you on your knees more? How do you have a counter to that? Holy water? For most people of faith, I think the the primary go-to solution is prayer, where individuals of, of the Christian faith pray for uh, protection. They pray for uh, good things to happen, and they don't rely on conjuring up evil or giving themselves or creating a vulnerability for the devil to come in and affect them. So I think it, it really goes to prayer. Now, different faiths have different ways to do that, whether it's praying the rosary or using holy water or whatnot. So I, I do think that Christians tend to pray, and it's typically heard, pray for a hedge of protection. Uh, from things like this happening. It's interesting on this discussion. The reason why I asked you those questions is because there are people out there that say, oh, please, you know, a Ouija board. Oh, for crying out loud. Oh, a hex. Oh, you've got to be kidding. It must be around Halloween. Who cares? And they don't guard against it. And yet they would call themselves Christian. And yet they're not taking the the protections that are afforded them through the Judeo-Christian tradition, such as holy water, such as prayer, such as scripture, particularly the New Testament, such as um, incense and candles and getting in a mind to reach God, to reach St. Michael the Archangel, to reach your guardian angel, to reach intervention through uh, Jesus Christ through Mary or any of the helpmates, the saints to guard against stuff like this and counter it. They are agnostic in their defense of uh, to to prosecute this. And I think a lot of that is driven by the culture, Terry. I think that most people don't want to deny good sound science, but you can't help being a member of faith. That there, and you can't deny that there is a spiritual realm to things, and that spiritual realm is very real. People don't know how to explain it. It's supernatural. And so put it back into the context of what's going on with these witches. I think that there is a, a, a tendency to get that spiritual realm within that side and try to use it to their advantage for a political purpose or or, you know, uh, to seek vengeance. And that's just wrong for many of us. Uh, well, it also happens that this particular congressional year, I always call every two years the congressional year, uh, we have an election around Halloween time. So don't witches come out and really capitalize on that October 31st time and uh, and do their thing? Do Do they or don't they have more power around Halloween and because the election is right around the corner, are they more powerful consequently? And therefore, Holy Spirits need to be conjured up. There needs to be be an effort that the Holy Spirits come and fight the battle against the occult. Yeah, a- absolutely. I think that the fact that we're in the season of Halloween and all saints makes the spiritual battleground even more prominent and real for many of these people. I just so happen to think that these witches, they're they're just upset that they've lost a lot of power and they see no other way to try to exercise power than to call upon evil to do the dirty work for them. And it it also gets them basically some publicity, some free publicity in their their message and name out there, despite the fact that our culture uh, uh, relies heavily on a very science reason based uh, component to it. So there's, we're not going to deny the the religious and spiritual component in our lives. This country is still very uh, much a spiritual country. 
And I think that we're just seeing a manifestation of it through this. Well, when I see uh, stories like this, and there's multiple stories out there, and again, it's not just any hex like putting pins in a voodoo doll. It's a hex to cause suffering, physical suffering, um, and even death. When I see stuff like this, I think, well, where are the onward Christian soldiers? Where are they? Because uh, they need to counter this if they are really true uh, in their fight in this spiritual battle of good and evil. That would be my take. Yeah, I, I would say they should probably be on their knees praying right now and um, and not ridiculing this or trying to, to write it off as just another bunch of crazy leftists performing some bizarre act to try to get publicity. I, you know, you make my point because if it really is a belief that we are in a spiritual battle that is manifested through the carnal, the, the, the time and space that we are here, then um, there needs to be more, uh, more asking of spiritual holy helpmates. And I'm not, I'm not here to say that there isn't, but I wonder if we could do more. Good job, Shane. Great. Thank you very much on that segment. We'll be back to talk about the Titanic sailing again when we return on Think America, Reason First, Then Converse. I'm Terry Gilbert. to Think America. I'm Terry Gilberg. This is America's Radio Town Hall. On to the next topic, thought-provoking conversation starters, which is the hallmark of the show. Let's talk about something completely different and yet an echo of something in the past. The Titanic 2, the famous Titanic uh, is back in the news. It's through the Titanic 2, or shall I say round 2, it is sailing again. The second Titanic, called the Titanic 2022, the second ship, will set sail in the year 2022, and it will take the same famous route in which most of her passengers drowned, as we all know, when she hit that iceberg. After leaving first, though, the second Titanic, or Titanic 2022, will leave first from Dubai before it leaves from England. Uh, Shane, are, would, would you even consider buying a ticket on the Titanic 2? Uh, I would. Um, I, I think it would be a very interesting um, trip to take and historic. I think it has a, a very strong appeal to many of us who, who like nostalgia and tend to want to try to relive things without all of the disaster that accompanies it. So I would definitely buy a ticket for this. I think it would be a, a fun experience. I would too. Now, we were just talking about hexes and things getting jinxed or, or, or those words that come from the occult in the previous segment. There are folks that say already, oh my God, I would never, ever do that. It's doomed. You know, there's just things that, are associated with the Titanic. You can't win with the Titanic. At which point I would say, all right, I'm buying a ticket and I'm bringing a jar of holy water into my cabin, right? Or I'll just, I'll just baptize, you know, they, they take champagne and they smash it, a champagne bottle, smash it on a ship for safe voyage. So why not a bottle of holy water, Shane? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that it doesn't have a hex on it. And don't forget, you also want to up your uh, your life insurance policy as well before you board the ship. <laughs> oh, right. You know, you talk about folklore and you talk about historic and you talk about uh, things that are meaningful. This is such a famous vessel. And now they're doing it again. And just for our audience's sake, uh, the inside is to be exactly like the original one. So you really get that sense of history when you buy a ticket and you would board. Now, remember, it's a ways away. We're only in 2018. Uh, but the idea is to have it exactly like it was, only bigger and better and more modern and not set to hit icebergs. And, of course, without Jack and Rose. So if, <laughs> if you're a history buff and you're really interested in this famous route, 
uh, where the passengers drown, but re- redoing that, re-going through that in your mind and, and the luxury of the inner cabins and taking yourself back in history. I say, why not? How gorgeous an event that would be. Yeah, from what I've seen pictures of this, it's going to be very close to what the original Titanic looked like. I I sure hope the bulkheads are constructed differently this time so that there are no major ways to to sink it. And I think that they're they are very mindful of that. I also believe that they're they've learned from history and realized that there are certain things that you do and you do do not want to do. We are much safer these days than we were back in 1912. And I, I believe that all the modern technology on this ship will be amazing. I, I look at some of the more modern cruise liners these days, and I just I'm stunned that they just don't topple or turn over because they seem so top heavy. This ship does not even look like that. It looks very streamlined, like mm-hmm. they used to make ocean liners in the past. But but boy, I, I, it looks like it's going to be a fantastic uh, trip back into history. Now, it's interesting. I saw some comments online about this Titanic leaving from Dubai first before it gets to England and then people getting off because it, they will not. They're still in that, uh, oh, my God, I can't get on that event because I will die. So they get off in London as opposed to or wherever it 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 docks Um Southampton or wherever it docks and and they will not take the journey from London to the United States they they still think it's jinxed isn't that interesting yeah and i think there's there's still a component in society about being superstitious about things you know what if they built another hindenburg would people get on that after seeing what happened in the past and that's typical human nature to try to to respond to look back and respond despite all conditions have changed and things are much different, more modernized and safety minded. Um, I, I, I don't understand why you wouldn't take it if you had the opportunity. It seems like it'd be a, a, a tremendous uh, a trip back in history for so many people that have followed the Titanic over the course of ages. And just for the record, I do not know what the price is from London into to the United States. I have no idea. I don't think pricing has been set yet. I don't imagine it will be cheap, but I do imagine that it will be sold out. And I do imagine that they will do it again and again and again and again as a touristy thing, as a thing to do. And if it is successful, this next go around, it will be a great hit. Final thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. I think back then they only charged you twenty dollars to ride it over, uh, and it'll be a much uh, higher price this time around. Oh yeah, and certainly if you're coming from Dubai, Dubai, Dubai and make the whole journey. Good discussion, Shane. Thank you very much for that. We'll take a break now, and when we come back, switch gears and talk about this new trend called micro dosing. Stick around. Think America. I'm Terry Gilbert. We're back on Think America with Terry Gilberg. Switching gears now, I'm very anxious to talk with the director of uh, OriginsRecovery.com. He is at OriginsBehavioralHealth.com out of Texas, Dr. John Dybin. On this topic of, in the vein of a little goes a long way, microdosing. What the heck is microdosing? Well, it's taking a tiny little bit of potent drugs so that you can get an effect or a little bit of a buzz from that drugs or drug or drugs without all of the serious side effects. It's my understanding this is the new thing now in Silicon Valley. Microdosers, for example, use a little of, say, LSD to improve their creativity. But The other side of it is that there are experts that say it doesn't improve your creativity at all. That's false. So I brought Dr. John Dybin on the program. Again, he is with Origins Behavioral Health Care. Hello, sir. Nice to have you, doctor. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. 
All right, this is the new thing, huh? Microdosing. Explain how much a little bit that can go a long way. How much is micro? So generally, you're talking anywhere from, they're generally talking about one-fifth to one-tenth of what would normally be considered a dose of a drug. And, and you're right, this is mostly uh, hallucinogens like LSD that, that people are doing this with or psilocybin. And, and a generally like a fifth to a tenth of a dose that would typically cause a person to have um, you know, those, those psychic kind of experiences is, is what they're talking about. And, and you said it exactly right. The, the goal, people's idea is if I just take a little bit, I can get all the good stuff and, you know, not have any of the, the, what we call side effects. Well, are they right? I mean, I have one glass of wine, I feel pretty good and I'm not drunk. However, it, it, oh, there's several things with that. Number one, it depends on your body and your brain. Everybody, you know, metabolizes that glass of wine a little bit differently. So for some people, one glass of wine isn't a problem at all. For other people, it can cause a significant issue. Your body, your brain, your health conditions, your age, all of those things are impacted by it. But here's the biggest difference. When you take a glass of wine, you have a generally pretty a good knowledge of what the alcohol content is with wine. When you're talking about drugs, especially like LSD, for example, the, the reality is that these are not regulated. They're not controlled. So you don't ever know. Nobody who uses drugs illicitly, uh, street drugs, really truly knows what the concentration is, what the purity is. So you're always, anytime you're taking uh, an, an, a, not, a, a drug that was not, you know, manufactured under, you know, regulatory conditions, you're taking a chance because you, you can't tell what the actual purity is and what the actual dose is. So you may take a smaller amount, but you're not ever sure of exactly what you're taking a small amount of. The other and thing, can't the same be say, said of this push for recreational marijuana, especially since experts say it is far more potent, far more, five, six, seven times more potent than the marijuana of, say, the 60s or the 70s? Actually, 25 to 30 times. Today is that right? Has 25 to 30 times more of the psychoactive ingredient THC. That's the stuff that gets you high. That's the stuff that causes addiction. That's um, 25 to 30 times more. So it's it's vastly different. And and that's a that's a good analogy. But but even even more so, you've got if you're getting LSD. You're getting it from some guy who's making it, in, you know, in his basement. Um, and, you know, it's even more difficult to tell what you're taking. The other thing is that, you know, and again, and I want to be, be clear that there is, there is currently no research into this. And so this is one of the dangers. Now, I'm not against having research into it. Let the scientists do their thing. But until there is good scientific understanding of what really happens, what people are doing is they're saying, you know, I've got this cup of mud in front of me, and I really don't want the dirt. I just want the water. So if I just drink a little bit, um, I'll only get, you know, I won't get as much dirt. But you're still getting mud. Mud is mud. So whenever you take a drug, drugs have effects. We call something, we call the ones we like effects, and we call the, the ones we don't like side effects. But the reality is all of them are just effects of the drug. And, and you cannot, especially with a drug that you're not sure about the potency of, you cannot accurately predict how uh, even lower doses uh, are going to impact and, and affect you. And so people put themselves at risk for not only uh, getting the positive experiences they want, but they put themselves at risk of experiencing all the negative deleterious effects of the drug as well. Mm -hmm. And yet it's catching on in Silicon Valley from what I read, especially with LSD, because they say, the users anyway, are very open about the fact that they're far more creative. Their cognitive skills, they're flying on all kinds of pistons in the brain. Um, can you address that and the Silicon Valley connection in particular, doctor? 
Sure. Well, and and let's and again, from a fairness perspective, there is there's very little research on it. But recently, there is some research on uh, utilizing these drugs. Uh, Johns Hopkins University did one in 2016. There was another one done by the New York University School of Medicine. And, and it was specifically looking at cancer patients, severe cancer patients, and it, it, they had tremendous depression and anxiety. Uh, and and the, they had trials where they gave these people uh, LSD or psilocybin, very, you know, these kind of similar acting things, and actually they had positive effects. They actually helped people's depression uh, and, and anxiety, these cancer patients. So there are some studies that show that there potentially are some helpful effects of these drugs, even drugs like psilocybin and, and LSD. The, the problem with that, again, is we don't have to, to villainize a drug to say that it's dangerous. The reality is people use drugs generally because it gives them a desired effect. The, the difficulty is twofold. Number one, it also comes along with, with the, the potential side effects. With LSD, the potential side effects are, are, are psychosis. They are developing depression and anxiety disorders. They are, you know, there's a lot of potential negative side effects. The other thing is we live currently in a nation that just believes in better living by better chemistry. It's this idea that if I have a problem, a pill should solve it. And the problem with that, not that I'm against all pills or medication, but the problem with that, that idea we have as a culture that a pill should make everything better is that we, we begin to lack to develop the skills, our own skills. It's sort of like, I want to run faster. So instead of like practicing running and, 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 and going out every day, I'm just going to get myself in a really fast wheelchair. Well, it'll make me go faster, but, but eventually I become dependent on it. And, and if that's all we do, then we lose the, that we stop developing uh, our natural brain growth, our natural personal growth, our natural spiritual growth, our natural uh, relational growth. And we begin to rely only on pills. Mm -hmm. We're down to about 90 seconds. And I want to give you kind of the last word about your clinic. And if people are listening, how to contact you, especially those that are doing this micro dosing with LSD. Absolutely. So here's the deal. If, 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 if your use of substances has begun to cause problems in your life, whether it's problems with your health, whether it's problems in your relationship or your work, or you just find that, that you want to use less and you can't, you find that your life's starting to lose control, contact us, get help. You have a medical health condition and you need help. You can find us at, at originsrecovery.com, but no matter who you seek out, do not try to do this on your own. And even if you have a, it's not you, it's for a loved one, get help. Don't try to take care of this alone. Dr. John Dybin at originsrecovery.com. We appreciate you very much being on the program. And uh, I'm sure those that are listening will, uh, will contact you or some kind of clinic if they need help. You bet. We appreciate you. My pleasure. Thank you. Quick break. I'm Terry. Be right back on Think America. Thanks for listening to Think America with Terry Gilberg. A great interview with Dr. John Dybin of OriginsRecovery.com on microdosing. So before we we start the next segment, Shane, what did you think of the interview? I thought it was a fascinating interview, Terry. I think that this is kind of a creative way to come up with uh, handling addiction problems. I'm curious, though, if... um, a couple of things, and I'm not speaking as for me personally, but do does micro do, dosing uh, uh, cause uh, some kind of a drug test to be uh, triggered? Mm. In other words, if you take a a, a a test, will it will it show up in your employer? 
detect it if you're in one of those situations where you do get drug tested. So I suppose it's it's whatever body you have, just like are you coming back from a luncheon where you had two scotches and the boss says, go urinate in the in this cup and we're taking a drug test on you. I don't know. It it just depends. And like he said, it depends on the body and it depends on the brain of that person. Um, All right. Let's switch to this other topic. I want to get to this. Uh, Cashing in on lonely people, I call it. It is a thing from what I read. It was a thing in the 80s with the Japanese. The loneliness economy took off then. And what do I mean by that? The country's population started to age, but the young people that typically take care of the elderly um, or even just those that are uh, kind of kicked to the curb by society and as a result become lonely. You don't have to uh, be, uh, you don't have loneliness just, just if you're elderly. But in Japan, this was a real problem. So businesses built around loneliness in Japan um, range from agencies that allow people to rent family members for company uh, during, let's say, a meal or um, to go out uh, and walk in the park, or to go to a movie screening with grandma or grandpa. So you could rent somebody to take away the loneliness from a family member. But then there's other things. You can now have a device. Uh, You can um, have interaction with an iPad. So what we've seen is loneliness was then. Loneliness is also now. It's just that now we have more devices. And certainly in China and Japan, they're big on devices, as we know. Uh, Firms in China are offering a range of artificial intelligence-based products that mimic interaction with humans. So you get a a robot on a screen, like a Siri or a Siri rather, or an Alexa type uh, character that will talk back, just like a kid would have a cartoon character, an animated character talking to the kid. And that is uh, an exchange and it alleviates some loneliness. So here's the question. Do these technologies replace the human physical connections to help soothe the lonely Or, uh, and if so, is that a temporary thing or do they ultimately solve the problem in your view? Well, let's just say uh, to to start off, I think the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well in Japan and China and and here in the United States to try to address this loneliness issue. But I also think that the the bigger problem here is that our, our culture and our society is becoming more dependent on technology and it starts at younger ages with with these kids um, becoming dependent and and the the thing is technology has drawn our attention away from other humans and it's it's created a dependency on it and we become increasingly more disconnected from other humans but why not it's easier to have a relationship with a device that an, than another human being and human relationships they they take work so you know, a device doesn't talk back to you. It doesn't offend you. It only frustrates you. And when that happens, you know, what do you do? You, you download the latest upgrade patch to, to fix it and you don't have to deal with the, the frustration of technology anymore. So we're, we're kind of putting ourselves into this mindset. And I think that's what's happening in China and Japan as well. And people don't want to talk about their loneliness. Do they? Oh, no, it's a stigma. They might have an iPad. They might have a cell phone. They might have a big screen Mac. They might have smart TVs. Who wants to talk about being lonely when you have all of these uh, attention devices, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a status to have, uh, you know, the automated television kitchen and, and car to get you to work. So, uh, you know, people don't want to admit that having all these devices on the other hand, is having great status, but on the other hand, it's also being very lonely. Um, Fooly is an artificial intelligence-powered robot do- dog. Have you heard of Fooly? F-U-L-I. It adopts speech and human characteristics to keep its owner company. That seems to help with older uh, elderly people. And I'm talking about China and Japan and, and, and the East. All right, let's wrap there, and we'll be right back on Think America, Reason First, Then Converse. I'm Terry Gilbert. We're 
We're back on Think America with Terry Gilbert. Time now for Megan, Megan Porth, who does a cameo on the program. She's always with us here on this one segment. To come in on it, we've been talking about cashing in on lonely people. And yes, Megan, it is a thing. We've been talking about the loneliness economy that uh, took off in Japan in the 80s when the country's population began aging and so many young people in the aging in in the in in Japan were not taking care of the aging Japanese they were trying to make a living and make it and they had investments in the United States they had investments in uh in China they had investments in Australia New Zealand they were all over the place and Japan was booming and making a lot of money and guess what grandpa Mom and dad were not taken care of. So there were some businesses that built themselves around the loneliness in Japan, um, which allowed other people to make their living by paying attention to the aged. So you could rent a person to help grandma and grandpa. We see that now with robots. What's your take on the lonely that's going on and this loneliness economy, making money on people being lonely? Yeah, I it's actually really interesting. I don't think that this is uh, isolated to Asia. In fact, um, they're finding that in the United States, people are reportedly becoming more and more lonely. And in fact, younger adults who are born between the mid-1990s and the early 2000s scored higher on a loneliness uh, scale than people who are 72 years and older in the United States. So what that tells me is it's not just for the aging population. I think there are a number of factors that are playing here. I think one of them is, of course, the the increase in technology. I mean, for me, Terry, I live in a large city. I can actually get much of what I need done in a day without having to leave my home. I can order my groceries online. I can order my supplies online. I can access the news on my television. I can, I, I can interact with people via social media and not ever actually talk to anyone on the phone. So I think you actually, what we're seeing is we're seeing a shift. We're, we're going to see a shift of people who are able to suddenly, we're going to have tips on how to manage loneliness, how to stay connected in a very physical way while we are still utilizing all of this technology. And I think that this is a growing industry. Um, it, it sounds really bad when it's, it, it's it, somebody says something like, oh, well, they're cashing in on loneliness. But I think that, that they didn't create the problem. I think that technology has really caused us to uh, be, feel isolated. And what concerns me about this in particular when it comes to our political and community issues is that the more disconnected we feel, Terry, the less likely we are going to be to relate with each other and to be able to discuss things with each other. And I think that's why we are so polarized politically, because we are able to say things about somebody because we aren't looking at them in their face. We don't know yeah, our neighbor. That's a good point. The irony, though, is that in with robots, we're supposed to have all of this connectivity. And yet it is a robot. So some people that want to hide out and and you mentioned those that, you know, you live in a big city and you can order everything in and you can hang out in your den and your bathrobe and work or whatever. Um, that's isolating. And yet they would say, no, it's not. Oh, my goodness. I'm connected. I'm connected. I can do a, uh, a, a talk, a conference call with Singapore, for example. So I'm connected. So it's kind of a funny irony in a way. Some people love robots. Other people love the human touch. Well, and especially since the solution seems to have stemmed from the problem, this solution of utilizing robots and artificial intelligence to decrease someone's loneliness and increase their connectivity is actually, it, it's kind of ironic. Um, and it seems like we're, we're kind of, it's all cyclical here because that's not real. That's not real human connectivity. I am curious though, Terry, to see how this technology advances and how the connection between artificial intelligence and humans moves forward and, and whether we're going to get to that point to where you don't know whether you're talking to a real life human or, or a robot. Good point. All right, let's wrap it up with change your life technology. Here we're talking about robots and technology and, and advancements in, in electronics and so forth. Uh, sponsored by yourcontractshop.com. Megan, what do you got to wrap up the show? 
Well, the Sahara Desert receives only one inch of rain a year. So what we're looking to do is actually leverage climate change, which we've been so um, scared of. There's actually scientists who are working on ways to leverage climate change in a very specific area like the Sahara Desert to bring things like more rain to make it more livable and more habitable. They utilize solar panels and wind turbines to change the topography of the Sahara Desert to bring more rain to that specific area. Obviously, continental scale change is is pretty far down the line, but uh, what a crazy concept, Terry. We're going to leverage climate change. Wow. Well, we'll read more and learn more about that going forward. Appreciate you, Megan. Thanks to our listeners. Thanks to Shane for being on the program. Of course, Megan, this is Think America with Terry Gilbert. Reason first, then converse. We'll see you next time.